The aim of this video is to introduce modal propositional logic. In particular, I'll look at the language of modal propositional logic, which consists of a set of symbols and a syntax. To start though, what I would like to do is state a little bit about what modal logic is. Modal logic is a type of formal logic. And so what this means is it aims to represent the good and bad arguments in a formal language. In particular, modal logic is an extension of propositional or predicate logic. In calling it an extension, what is being asserted is that you have a particular language, let's say propositional logic, and you're going to add to this language something else, some new feature to it. And in adding to that new feature, you'll get modal propositional logic. So what is being added is a set of operators that aim to express a modality. A modality is a way of qualifying a particular statement, proposition, or the truth or falsity of a statement. The term or expression that qualifies the statement is known as a modal. So let's look at an example of a modal. Suppose we start with the sentence that tech is tall. Well, we could qualify this sentence rather than saying that tech is tall or it's actually the case or it is the case that tech is tall or it's true that tech is tall. We might say that it is possible that tech is tall. And asserting that it's possible that tech is tall, this part where it says it is possible qualifies the truth or the proposition that tech is tall. And so it is possible is a modal. Here's another example. Take the proposition centaurs exist. You might qualify that statement by saying centaurs possibly exist, or you might say it was the case that centaurs existed. In both cases, you would be using a modal to qualify a proposition centaurs exist. Now there are many different types of ways uh, you can qualify the truth of a statement or qualify a proposition. The most common ones are known as alethic modals. And these are qualifying a particular, the truth of a particular proposition by saying it's necessary that that proposition is the case or it's possible that, it, that a proposition is the case. Another example of a modal has to do with time. Rather than saying it is raining, you might say it is raining in the present, in which case you're qualifying it with respect to occurring right now at the moment of the utterance. But you also might say that it is raining in the future or raining in the past or it will be raining or it was raining. Here you're specifying the time in which your statement is the case. Another example would be in terms of morality. Certainly there's a difference between saying there is price gouging or monopolistic practices in the wheat market versus there should be no price gouging or monopolistic practices in the wheat market or it's permissible for there to be price gouging in the wheat market. Epistemic modals have to do with knowledge. Doxastic modals have to do with belief. And there are many other ways that you might qualify a proposition or the truth of a proposition using a modal expression. So you can understand why someone would wanna build a logic around modal expressions. You would draw different conclusions logically from a statement like someone will necessarily be convicted as opposed to someone possibly will be convicted. So in the case of modal logic, we'll try to represent modals, these expressions that qualify statements using an operator. And these operators will be logical constants. They'll have a fixed meaning. To give a kind of illustration, in propositional logic, what we do is take truth functional uses of the term and, and always represent those ands with the caret or sign for conjunction. In predicate logic, we do something similar with all or some. We represent some using the backwards e for there exists or there's at least one. In modal logic, we'll try to do the same thing. We'll treat these modal expressions like it is necessary that a, this modal expression and represent it using a specific operator. So let's start by looking at the symbols of modal propositional logic. The formal language consists of a set of symbols and a syntax, so we'll start with the symbols. If you have a good grasp of propositional logic, then understanding modal proposition logic is really straightforward. The reason is, is because since we wanna capture these modal expressions, all we need to do is add a couple new symbols to represent those modal expressions. 
It's important to note that the type of modal logic you are trying to develop, whether it's for time or necessity and possibility or obligation, the type of symbol you introduce will vary. So for example, if we wanna say that a particular proposition is necessarily the case, then we might use, uh, make use of this box, which is it's common to do. But if you wanna say something is obligatory or you, you, know, you must do this particular action, you might make use of the symbol O to represent the, this particular modal. So since there are so many different modals, we're going to narrow in on one particular set or type, and that's the ones that have to do with necessity and possibility. So what are the symbols of modal propositional logic? First, we make use of uppercase letters, A through Z, and we make use of subscripted positive integers. The use of subscripted positive integers is simply to make sure we have an infinite number so we never run out. Next, we'll make use of truth functional operators. And I would say that the majority of texts that deal with modal propositional logic would only deal with a smaller subset of these symbols. So you might see, let's say, negation and the sign for conditionality. But here we'll just simply state that any of these, let's see, five operators are part of the language. So the sign for negation is a symbol, the sign for conjunction is a symbol, the sign for disjunction is a symbol, conditionality and biconditionality. In addition to the truth functional operators, we'll also make use of parentheses, braces, and brackets if needed. For the most part, we'll simply use the open and close parentheses to indicate the scope of operators. And finally, the new addition to modal propositional logic, that is what makes it different from propositional logic, is the inclusion of the diamond and the box. This diamond here will represent possibility, whereas the box will represent necessity. Just as a kind of fun exercise, here we have uh, seven symbols, and we want to know which of the following are not symbols in modal propositional logic. In looking through this, I think the answer is pretty obvious. The first five are all symbols in modal propositional logic. The diamond is a modal operator. The box is a modal operator. P and Q are propositional letters. The sign here for negation is a truth functional operator but seven and this ampersand are not symbols in modal propositional logic. Now that we have a grasp of what the symbols or the alphabet or the characters of the language, we move on to syntax. This has to do with how do we put those symbols together in a way that would make a grammatically correct sentence or formula. The syntax of modal propositional logic is specified by a set of rules. You might think of them as grammatical rules, but they're also called formation rules. These are rules that allow you to take those symbols and construct formulas from them. When we take those symbols and use the formation rules on those symbols, what we get are what are called well-formed formulas. These are, you could think of the grammatically correct sentences. Since well-formed formulas is a mouthful, I'll routinely simply say woofs, uh, just as an abbreviation for well-formed formula. If you have a good grasp of propositional logic, then the syntax of modal propositional logic is easy to understand. It's the same syntax or same grammar. The only addition is that there is one new rule that for well-formed formulas that use the modal operator. So here are the modal propositional logic formation rules, the rules that specify how we can form well-formed formulas. The first rule, very straightforward. If you have a propositional letter, A, B, C, Z, with or without subscripts, then that is a well-formed formula. Second, if you have a particular formula, let's call it phi, and it is a woof, like you've established that it's already a woof, then taking that formula and putting the negation to the left of it is also a well-formed formula. Similarly, if you have phi and psi, then you can take each one of those formulas and put a connective or one of the following truth operators between them. You can put the conjunction between them, the sign for disjunction, the sign for conditionality, and the sign for biconditionality. 
So provided you've established that phi is a woof and psi is a woof, then taking those two formulas and putting one of those four operators between them will also give you a woof. So what I wanna pay closer attention to is rule four, because this is the new rule for modal propositional logic. This rule states that if you have a formula phi and it's a woof, then you can take either the diamond or the box and place it to the left of that formula. So if phi is a woof, then diamond phi is a woof, as well as box phi are, is a woof. So this is the new rule. This is the how the syntax of modal propositional logic is different from propositional logic. We have this new rule that specifies how to form woofs that make use of the diamond in the box. The last rule simply states that there's nothing else is a well-formed formula except for those things that can be constructed using these four uh, rules here. Let's look at an example. And in this example, we'll show that box diamond P is a well-formed formula. We would start simply by showing that P is a well-formed formula. We would establish this through rule one, which says all propositional letters are well-formed formulas. At line two, we would say, since we've established P as a well-formed formula, then we can form the formula diamond P. This would also be a well-formed formula. Rule four states that if you have a formula, then you can put either the box or the diamond in front of it, and the result is a well-formed formula. And since we know P is a well-formed formula, diamond P is a well-formed formula. At line three, since we've established that diamond P is a well-formed formula, then we can take this formula, diamond P, and place the box in front of it. And so box diamond P is also a well-formed formula. This again is by rule four, which says that if you have a formula, you can put the box or the diamond in front of it. So in using the formation rule, we have not only constructed that box diamond P is a well-formed formula, but we've also proven using the rules that it is a wolf. One thing to know about box diamond P is it's ugly looking, it's not pleasant to look at, and so we might think about how to simplify this formula, how to develop some conventions to make it easier to read. The way to do this is to think about what is the purpose of those parentheses. And generally the purpose of parentheses is to disambiguate the scope of operators. So the goal will be to read the formula or develop a convention in a way that allows us to remove those parentheses to make the formula easier to read. So let's look at how we would simplify box diamond P. So we would simplify it by taking off all of the parentheses. And the way we would be able to justify this is to say that the operator always will apply to the subformula to its immediate right. And if we want the operator to apply to a larger subformula to its right, then we'll make use of parentheses to give it wider scope. So to give an illustration of this, we have two formulas, box P and Q, which contains parentheses, as well as box P and Q, which does not contain the parentheses. The way we'll read box P and Q with the parentheses is since we're using parentheses here, these parentheses will indicate to us that this box has a wide scope. It applies not simply to P, but to this entire subformula P and Q, into the entire conjunction. In contrast, without the parentheses, we'll just interpret box P as applying to this formula to its subformula to its immediate right. And so in this case, box P and Q, only the scope of box only applies to P and not into the entire conjunction. So the short of it is, will only make use of parentheses to disambiguate the scope of an operator, and only when we want a particular operator to take wide rather than narrow scope. As one last kind of example of this, we'll show that not box diamond P, right arrow box R is a well-formed formula. And I think if we can show that this is a well-formed formula using the rules, then we'll have a really good grasp on the syntax of the language. So to start, we will first state that P and R are well-formed formulas. We can do this because all propositional letters are woofs. Then we can assert that since R is a woof and P is a woof, then adding a modal operator to its immediate left is a well-formed formula. 
And we won't need parentheses here because we'll interpret the box and the diamond as applying to the formula to its immediate right. And there's no way we would be confused about the scope of this operator. Next, we'll take, since diamond P is a wolf, then we can take that formula, diamond P, and put a box to its left. And the result is a well-formed formula. At line five, since we've established that box diamond P is a well-formed formula, we established this at line four, and we established that box R is a well-formed formula, we established this at line two, then we can take these two formulas and put them together and add the arrow between the two, and the result is a well-formed formula. Now that we've established that box diamond P, right arrow, box R is a woof, we can simply take that entire formula and negate it, place the negation to the left of it. And since we want to indicate that this negation applies to the whole formula, that it is, has wide scope, we will put parentheses around the entire formula. And so we've established using these formation rules that this particular formula is a well-formed formula. In addition, we've constructed the formula using those formation rules. So a couple key points to keep in mind. First, modal propositional logic is a formal language. That means it has a set of symbols and a syntax. Second, since modal propositional logic is an extension of propositional logic, it takes in all of propositional logic and what it does is add two new symbols. The symbol for necessity, which we represent using the box, and the symbol for possibility, which we represent using the diamond. And then lastly, the modal propositional logic well-formed formulas are created in the same way that propositional logic well-formed formulas are through a set of formation rules. Mm -hmm.